You just have to click on got it. Yeah, got it. One minute to go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Carvan, the Heritage Exploration Initiative. My name is Ishan Sharma, and with me, I have two wonderful guests uh, to talk about a super topical and timely theme, uh, which is Taj Mahal, which is again in the news. Uh, I'll introduce the speakers, and then we'll start with the conversation and the PowerPoint presentation. So Amita Beg is the executive director of World Monuments Fund India. She has stewarded conversations and preservation across India for over three decades. She was also a core member of the Taj Mahal Conservation Collaborative and over 10 years of engagement at the monument resulted in the book called Taj Mahal Multiple Narratives, which she co-authored with Rahul Mehrotra, where they explored its multiple narratives of building the monument and even after life of the monument. She has also published Forts and Palaces of India. And to have this conversation, we also have Sohail Hashmi, who is a writer, filmmaker, who identifies himself as a history buff and a heritage enthusiast based out of Delhi. He has been conducting heritage walks in Delhi for almost two decades. He's one of the founding trustees of Sahmat, the Safdar Hashmi Memorial Trust. And he's also one of the mentors for all of us at Karwan. So thank you so much, uh, Sohil Saab and uh, Amita Ji for accepting this invitation. It is truly an honor hosting both of you to have this conversation. And I think, uh, ma'am, you want to start with the PowerPoint so you can start sharing uh, the PowerPoint. I'll meet both of you after the conversation. Thank you. Slide show. Good evening and thank you so much. Can you hear me? Um, thank you so much for inviting me, Ashan. I'm delighted to be here and to share my experiences and my knowledge of the Taj Mahal. It's, it's um, a wonderful, it was, and it remains with me as one of the greatest privileges to have worked here. I think that's a rarity that only, so I think largely the ASI has. And, so we are, we are very cognizant and we became even more um, careful with how we approached this because Rahul and I both had the sense from the very first time we walked in together that this was something more than just a beautiful monument. It was a, it was a sacred moment. And I think that's what drove us to immerse ourselves as deeply in this book and um, over, a number of years bring it together. So all of you know the background of the Taj and you know, for all of us, the stories go that he loved his wife who died in childbirth so much and so deeply that he built one of the most enduring architectural legacies in the world. But I think equally, one needs to recognize that the Taj Mahal represents the zenith 
of the Mughal Empire, neither before or since has such magnificence been built in India. It's part, it is of course a memorial to his wife. It is as celebrating the greatness of the emperor and perhaps even at another level seeking immortality. And I think that's uh, something that you sort of read into the building. It's not inscribed in a text. You think this is so much more than a beautiful monument. And, you know, we're coming from the monuments of Samarkand, and then you get to Humayu's tomb and Sikand. Here you arrive at this perfect, pristine, white marble mausoleum. Inscribed on the earth in perfect cardinal direction, it was the center of the emperor's vision. Because in those days you had the fresh flowing snow fed waters of the Himalayas. The Jamna was pure, it was clean, and it arrived with huge quantity of water in Agra. Built just outside the city, it was conceived as paradise on earth, blurring the lines between royal, spiritual, sacred, cosmological, astronomical, scientific, and imperial. Across the river, there's Mehtab Bagh, which was the perfect foil to the sacred garden. It's a complex rich in allegory and the more you invest in it, the deeper the stories become. And it is a firm belief that he built, it is a known now that after the excavations that Mehtab Bagh and the Taj Mahal were built in a single uh, design plan with the river at the center. But what we call today the main gate with the colonnades flanking it was really for the public, such as the public were allowed in. There was the Jalau Khana out here where you waited to enter and then you entered the main gate. Nobody could actually enter the garden because this was a paradisical garden and beyond sequestered in the trees and the plants, the dome rose. And so you had a glimpse of it. It was only visible perhaps to the royal families and the few nobility. The rest, you would look up this heavenly uh, eye. It would draw the eyes heavenward, the imagination of Jannat with the throne of God at its feet. Shah Jahan, I think you can't see the PowerPoint right now. It's not visible. You can't visible. see it? No, no. Oh gosh, let me just, sorry. I've got... So where is your share screen? It's a green icon just in yeah. the middle of the screen. Now, so now. Is that it? Yes. Now you can go full screen with the PowerPoint, the slideshow. Yeah. Now. How do I get the full screen? Right. Okay, will you do it, Ashan? I don't have. You have to go to slideshow. Yeah, I do, but all these icons are. No. <laughs> all right. Ashan, are you going to take it over and run it? No. All right. Yeah. So yeah. I... yeah. So do I, I'll just go quickly back over this. Are you, are you running it? I don't know how to go to the whole screen. Okay. Historically, as I said, the visitor only ever saw the Taj Mahal from the main gates and the colonnades because beyond paradise was completely inaccessible. You would only have seen the dome through the trees and that evocative image below is how you would have seen it. And the eyes would continuously be drawn heavenward for this incredible guava shaped dome. But Shah Jahan's view was very much from the riverfront. How he conceived the Taj was circumscribed by this perception. Remember, um, Shah Jahan never came by road to the Taj. He, would, he lived in Agra Fort and he came by longboat because there was no question in those days of the emperor walking on the street that that was 
in, uh, absolutely not acceptable. So there was a pier to the Agra fort and he came by boat. So his perception, his design was completely centered from the river. And that is very evident when you see that the riverfront wall that you see here is the only um, embellished wall of the whole Taj, of the exterior of the Taj. The other walls are completely plain. This wall is richly embellished. And we were delighted to find in the ASI archives, a 1922 photograph after the floods receded in 1922, the Shah Jahan's entrance. So he entered from this tiny door, which has beautiful marble steps into a series of galleries and rooms, which are now so infamous, um, to enter the crypt. Shah Jahan and his, the royal family were the only people who were allowed to enter the crypt no other people were allowed in. And I think that the sacredness of that was vitally important to him. And remember the crypt is below surface as in Islamic tradition. The building is designed in the hushed bahisht plan of eight chambers with a sacred central chamber housing the cenotaphs where the prayers were read around the clock. So that's in the upper level and there are the eight rooms around it. It's only the central room, which is so highly embellished. The mausoleum dominates the landscape. It has been like that for 400 years. It doesn't matter how much the city has developed and the ecology has changed. The river no longer flows alongside the monument. It still has this incredible dominance over the site. The scale of the double dome is exceptional in its height as well as its neck. And if you look carefully at the flowers that are uh, in, inlaid around the neck of the dome, these are flowers in perpetual mourning. And I, I you know, it's the, it's the detail of this that is so evocative of the intent. What was very exciting for us and what we found in during the course of our studies were these drawings at the end. And these drawings are on the lower level of the, uh, plat the sandstone platform in the Jamaat Khana. So you could imagine no architectural drawings of the Taj have ever been found, but you could imagine the Karyagar and his, his own architect, um, Ustad Ahmed Lahori, sitting on the floor and the, the sketches is clearly the shape of doing the shape of the dome by the line of sight in its slope and its scale height. And that's all drawn on the floor. And there are Persian notations. And it took a lot of work for us to um, <clears throat> persuade the ASI to close off the Jamaat Khana because we felt this was the most important um, element that we had worked with them to find and to interpret and to see it was an incredible moment of, oh my gosh, this is how they, they planned it. Within, I think this is one of the most wonderful contrasts of the Taj. You have this enormous building and this scale and the perfection and this dome that reaches incredible heights. And inside are these minute, detailed, highly refined, delicate, engravings. They are inlays, there's carving, there's flowers, there's um, every element that you could think of. The grave of Mumtaz Mahal is itself inlaid with the names of Allah over the pishtaks or the entrance archways. There are, if you include them all, there are some hundred meters of surah and the text is unequivocal. Enter thou into my paradise. So you know that um, the intent was always this. And are the flowers there? Are they intended to be um, flowers in perpetual mourning? Are they intended to be per the permanent flowers of paradise as you're assured fruit and flowers and shade and water in perpetuity. So are these flowers therefore in perpetuity? They are otherworldly, they are a fantastical, and they are stylized. There are narcissus and tulips and jannat's everlasting flowers. 
Some are inlaid with as many as 60, 65 pieces of jewels. There's carnelian, there's agate, there's jasper. These were brought from hundreds and thousands of miles away in minute detail. And I, it's this play and this uh, counterplay of massive building and absolutely the most refined inlays and sculptures you could possibly imagine. Within are these incredible graves. And I think we need to recognize that to this day, 400 years later, the Urz of Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal are still um, um, observed. There's a full-fledged uh, ritual for both outside and then the flowers are charred inside. I think um, what will remain for me a lasting query, and I hope there will be another generation who will investigate this, what did Shah Jahan envisage for himself? There in this perfect symmetry lies Shah Jahan's grave completely off center. It is the only thing that breaks this, the perfection of the site. Of course, it is the most beautiful tomb, but it is not in alignment. It is in cardinal direction, but it is, is it the cardinal direction? Um, hers clearly was. So what did he plan for himself? One could only hope there's another generation who will explore this. We had the great privilege of working with the ASI um, on documenting some of this work and advising them. And we watched the conservation of the North Wall. And these Karyagar come in from the area around. They are undoubtedly descendants of the people who built the Taj. And I think it's generations. And I, that's the beauty of India is this continuous living cultural tradition. And it's something we must celebrate, venerate, because it is their knowledge and their inherited knowledge, which enables us to have and to maintain one of the most extraordinary monuments of the world. So we have a high level of skills working in the Taj and to be there and to learn from them. And it's, it's something, you know, when you um, look at conservation internationally, everybody's talking about, well, we must train people. In India, we, for us working in the Taj, it was the reverse. We were learning. We were learning from people who had worked there, who had learned from their fathers. And I remember talking to one of the um, inlay workers and I said, what's the future of this? And he said, I'm terribly afraid my son will not do this work. And so I think we have to find every possible way to encourage, celebrate, as for instance, Japan does, they, they celebrate their craftsmen as living heritage. And so to Meta Bag, you know, you, there's always the same the story. So to just finish my last slide, I just want to say to you that there are many, many stories about how the hands of the craftsmen were cut off. The presence of these people who maintain it was their forefathers who worked here belies that. They are here, they know their grandfather and Bardadas worked here. So I, I think that's also uh, where we need to get a little bit of perspective and reality. There was nobody's hand chopped off. The, uh, the point to be thought of though is um, that they probably went on to Delhi with Shah Jahan to uh, build Delhi. But now to Mehtab Bagh, the moonlight garden across the river. And this is really um, the story that went for donkey's years of the Black Taj. But there is an Aurangzeb letter to his father talking about how Mehtab Bagh, which was clearly designed during, um, at the time of the Taj Mahal. And he goes back to you know, 15 years later, and there's a whole description of how the Taj Dome was leaking, but that Mehtab Bagh was ruined. So clearly it was in the floodplain. It was built lower than the Taj because the Taj, as you know, is built on these enormous wells and raises, rises to an enormous height off the river. And Mehtab Bagh is much more embedded in the landscape. It was designed as a moonlight garden. It is the mirror image of the Taj. It is the exact size. 
and at the center is the octagonal pond. And it is the exact size of the octagonal base of the Taj Mahal. And when it has 25 fountains, so when full, you would have a reflection of the Taj. It could have been dark and, and, and mysterious, or it could have been ephemeral, beautiful, and reflective of the Taj where you can't really touch it, but it's there. So it's, and it's in constant motion. It's, it's an illusion at many times. So for Shah Jahan, he would visit the Taj to conduct his sacred rituals and the moonlight garden, which you would enjoy by moonlight. And um, there was at its time, beautiful gardens, flowing waters, and one as a complete perfect mirror image of the other. So today we now have the Taj facing a lot of problems. And before we get into more recent problems, it is enveloped in a 500 meter green belt, secluded. You, the reason for this 500 meter green belt, as many of you will know, is the 1996 Supreme Court judgment, which uh, ordered the 500 meter green belt to protect the Taj Mahal from pollution. The time the Taj, Agra wasn't a very big city, but it was very industrialized. So it forced industry to move out. It closed down all the foundries. and. Interestingly, also a lot of the local crafts, which had existed also since Mughal times. But having protected it, you still, you can't manage the crowd. There are, you know, 40, 60,000 people, of course, not in this pandemic season, but two years ago, as much as 60 and 70,000 people. The site has moved from the sacred to the profane. It is a democratic space. Access is available to all. And today its management for the future is its single largest challenge because this was designed to be venerated by just a handful of people, not by the hordes and hordes who now visit it, which, and so they must, but there has to be a better, we have to respect our heritage in order to um, preserve it. So let me talk to you a little bit about the Riverfront Garden City because that is how Agra came up. It came up at the time of Babur. Um, he, having won his battle of Panipat, proceeded to Delhi and then to Agra to take over the fort, which was then Sikandar Lodi. So being in Agra was an essential thing. Of course, he disliked the city. He crossed the river and built his very first garden. The city, then grew around that whole ideal of having a riverfront garden. Um, and it was the relationship with the water that made Hindustan bearable for them. <clears throat> These are incredible records. I mean, this painting is extraordinary. You have the Taj Mahal there, you have Itmada Dola's tomb there, probably many other tombs who have not fared so well. And there's the Agra fort. So from the emperor's viewpoint, he could see across to all these monuments and the river was framed by them. It's also interesting that never in India before had we framed the river on both sides. The Jamna always had a floodplain. So with the arrival of Agra and B, suddenly the river is channeled through. There were a whole host of other problems which we face today. But in its day, these are the two old, this is the famous Jaipur map of Agra. It is one of the oldest. And it was subsequently mapped uh, by the ASI to try and see today what survives of the uh, original city. And of course, on this side of the city, which was occupied by the British with the fort, taking over the fort, the riverfront havelis were all demolished. There was a high, uh, the strand was built. The railway line came in right here and separated the Jama Masjid from the Kila. So perceptionally, you'd removed the holy space or the house of prayer from the life that lived within the fort and around it. And, but on this side, the riverfront gardens fared much better. For, of the 44 gardens, only four remain. But in the 18th century, the British Library has released an extraordinary scroll where every single one of them is recorded. 
We have even a major tailor who's um, <clears throat> appropriated one of the gardens and named it his, after him uh, in his name. And Khane Alam, which is the garden which now has the entire water system for the Taj Mahal is right here. There's an elephant shed. A lot of it is incorrectly named, but it was as, as they best knew how. So their lifestyle was of imperial grandeur. It had immense charbags. They had the they owned the waterfront. And the whole idea of the charbag is it's a secluded garden. The height of the wall was determined by the height of an elephant and a man sitting on top. So nobody walked going past on an elephant could ever see inside. So there was this life of great opulence and luxury, even as they propagated austerity and um, high ideals from the Divane arm. Within there were these great oases where they were lush, they were, they had fresh water, they were just, and in the winter they had hammams where the water was heated. So it played a role at both times and the flowers were probably at their best. So this was the center of life. These char bags were social spaces and in time, many of them became uh, tombs, because the the uh, the charbag then translated into a paradise garden. So it was a it was an interesting transition which they had. So Rambag, which was the earliest char, said to be the earliest charbag. I mean, we've done not such uh, amazing things with our heritage. There's a highway on this side which took out the elephant stables, and it now rises high above the garden. It's the new wall. The one portion of the garden has been saved. It's an enormous garden. And, but it was used continuously. Jahangir gave it to Nur Jahan. She, it was her pleasure garden because in those days they didn't own these bags beyond their own lifetime. They was, these were Jagirdaris for their lifetime. So Jahangir very quickly gave this to Nur Jahan, so it stayed within the family and eventually the British appropriated it, built an extra floor with canopies and even added to the painting. They must have, you know, tried to explore the world of the Mughals and emulate them in some way. And then further along, we come the many, many gardens which are now missing. Sultan Razia's tomb is missing and you arrive at Itmad Dawla, which was built by Nur Jahan for her parents. Ismad Udala was Jahangir's prime minister and Gyas Beg and Azmat Begum were, Azmat Begum first and then Gyas Beg were buried here. I, what's interesting here, although it's talked, often we believe and it's said that this is the baby Taj and it influenced enormously the designs of the Taj. Because of Nur Jahan's own lineage, she was Persian, Yas Bey came to India from Persia to Akbar's court. So there's a lot of Persian influence as well. And I think it's what then culminates in the Taj is this meshing of ideas and, and styles and so on. Uh, the tomb, well, to me, this is one of the most beautiful ones, the tomb of Afsal Khan or Chinika Rosa, which is just um, upstream from Itmadudola. Nobody goes there. It's, 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 they play cricket here and the cricket just the cricket ball destroy, you know, hits against the wall and another piece of tile falls off. Um, it's a shame that much of this is off the tourist map. Nobody really sees it. What is seen, of course, is across the river on this side of the river, the Agra Fort. It is an immense size and scale. It straddled the river in its day. Absolutely, the water flowed past. The uh, emperors had a pier because they traveled from Delhi to Agra and beyond by boat. So they entered from here. They could, there wasn't really, you know, there's a lovely description of Shah Jahan visit, visiting Apsal Khan, his father in law, um, where he went to Spes for a Dawat. 
and the road was covered with velvet and covered in gold ashrafis. So him walking around the city was not really an option. So the fort was a city, the inner fort was a city in itself. And access for them was always from the river. And it re retained that incredible presence on the riverfront, as you can see in this 18th century uh, image below. You don't get that anymore. You just see a sliver of it and there's a highway that runs alongside, um, which you can see here. It's lost its sense of being part of the landscape of Agra. But inside, it, inside is its incredibly richly embellished building. It's painted, it's engraved. The hammam has the most incredible carvings. Um, the, the white royal buildings, the Divane Khas, the king's personal chambers, the Murti Masjid, these were all additions made on the waterfront by Shah Jahan. The rest of the, um, and they were all white and it was a very sort of imperial thing. He moved from the sort of very imperial red sandstone <clears throat> that Akbar was noted for in the fort and in Fatipur Sikri to this jewel-like interior. And this breaches again its apogee uh, at the Taj. Further off the radar is Sikandra set in a gigantic garden, still with black buck roaming gardens, beautifully painted interior. This is in fact, more classically how a tomb is prescribed to be. It is open to sky at the top level and it's without that dome, it's at five levels. So it's a very interesting scale and size. And there are other absolutely charming, um, sites that, I mean, here is Hessing's tomb in the Catholic cemetery. It's Mrs. Hessing clearly had grandiose ideals, uh, 19th century, little Taj Mahal in the Catholic cemetery. And of course the Jama Masjid, which is the, one of the most perfect mosques with the most beautiful uh, dome. And this was lost in relationship to the city and to the fort. Uh, with the arrival of this railway line. And you know that connection of the fort to the main Jama Masjid, which you see even in the Delhi Shah Jahanabad fort with the main Jama Masjid, it's line of sight, you have a spiritual connection to it. And now there's a railway line and a railway station. And this is an absolutely brilliant little building at the edge of, um, of uh, Agra, this was Bhatti's Khamba. In its heyday, it was controlled by Nur Jahan, who controlled trade into Agra. This is where you paid toll to enter Agra. There's the Nur, Ma, uh, Nur Sarai behind it, where if you weren't allowed in, you could stay. But she collected the toll from every visitor and trader. And you know, Agra at that time was more populous than London, larger than uh, Constantinople. It boasted some 85 Sarais and 40 Hamams everybody in the world. It was the emporium of the trade of the world. Everybody came to Agra and here in this broken down little Bhattis Khamba is where the tax, the toll was collected to enter Agra before you got to do business. So, but in the tumult of Agra and this, you, this is a photograph we took two years ago, three years ago and the seemingly bucolic landscape belies the unreason uneasy reality that today the Taj has almost no connection with the city. The government in its wisdom has built this fantastic eight lane highway, the Jamna Expressway or the Taj Expressway. So it's a one point agenda from Delhi to Noida to a kilometer short of the Taj. Effectively, you could have breakfast in Delhi and see the Taj and be back in Delhi for lunch. I mean, on a good day, that's how you could do it which takes away from the larger story, from understanding the monument, its relationship with Mehta Bagh and the multiple other monuments. And you think that if you were going to manage the monument better, you would look at dispersal and upgrade the city to manage that dispersal. It's not for lack of plans. It's not for want of world banks, the nation development banks, the whole world and his wife. 
has developed plans and programs for Agra, but we have, you know, we just um, grow the revenues of the monument and it doesn't feed back into a balanced development for Agra. So at some point, there will also be this situation where the city is completely annihilated from its heritage. And I think that's something we need to look at uh, in how we go forward. So thank you so much. And I'm sorry I couldn't get the slideshow up completely. Thank you so much, ma'am. So Elsa, if, if you are there. Yeah, I'm there. Except that, yes, there I am. Oh, uh, really incredible. Uh, and, and the way you have taken us through uh, Agra and, and how the um, Taj was placed in the, and its relationship with all the um, river facing gardens and palaces and and and, and you, you you talked uh, quite a bit about uh, the first garden and and through your uh, discussion there is uh, uh, references to uh, this idea of the char park now uh, and its connection to heaven now this is something that has been bothering me uh, quite a bit and uh, uh, because, you know, a, if you look at uh, the, uh, the first garden that is built in India uh, by Babar, uh, now known as the Ramba. When Babar built it, he called it uh, the bagh e Gulafshan. And uh, he was, uh, he brought, the, there is a stone tablet outside which lists the number of fruit bearing trees he introduced to India. Uh, the plums, the pomegranates, the pears, the, you know, it's an endless list. And uh, none of them survived because, you know, they were not suited for the climate uh, of Agra. But before he comes here, he had built uh, a garden in Kabul and he had left his will to be buried there. But before uh, Kabul, he built a garden in Fargana. Fargana, that was the first city that he had uh, conquered when he was in his mid-teens. And he built a garden there. Now, I have a feeling that what the Mughals were trying to do was to go back to the garden that Babar had built. And, uh, and, and, you know, because Fargana, is, I've, I've, I've had the good fortune of visiting Fargana. It is such a beautiful valley. And there are mountains nearby, hills nearby. And there would have been a, you know, nat uh, natural stream coming down the hills. And he just created uh, terraces and planted his fruit bearing trees and shrubs and all that flowering shrubs and you had the garden and uh, traveling to the city that Temur built I stopped on the way several times for a cup of tea or a meal and there were these little streams and around which people had built gardens you know so my gut feeling is that this got nothing to do with heaven this is what this is the tradition of gardens that existed in that area and it would go back to babylon and uh, sumer and all that you know this tradition of gardens and wherever the mughals went and built something they called it uh, paradise agar firdaus barrue zaminas they kept on writing it everywhere because you see, and, and, and this is this is what we do in our real lives as well. 
you go to a place that you take a liking to and you say this is like heaven ye to jannat hai so you know they were not because the jannat that is described in the quran i am sorry it is flowing water and shade giving trees this is the imagination of somebody who lives in the desert but the moguls did not come from a desert they came from one of the most fertile valleys in uzbekistan so it is this idea that has traveled and i think that this constant repetition that this is uh, inspired by heaven is of this is a one piece from where the idea of islamic architecture is born because the dome has nothing to do with islam the dome is roman it has evolved from the arch which is sumerian there are domes all over the world and nobody calls them uh, islamic it's only in central asia and middle east and uh, you know and in south asia that the dome and the arch suddenly become islamic so this is this is the deliberate uh, division that they have created and they have created this myth of islamic architecture and the myth of hindu architecture though there is no reference ever to christian architecture you know their architecture is gothic uh, or uh, lady you know, yeah. baroque or uh, renaissance or whatever or it is hispanic and scottish and irish and so on and so forth but yes. our architecture has only to be seen in denominational terms i think this is how they have succeeded in dividing our heritage through hindu and muslim and it is the consequences of that that we are seeing today and th- this was just just an observation i thought I'll, i'll i'll make but coming more specifically to the implications of this <coughs> and 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 this is what i would like uh, to have your opinion on what is this uh, every day they come up with something and now they are saying that uh, this is actually uh, this was a temple now you have you have been involved in uh, the restoration with the asi and you you refer to these so called closed rooms and you mention that this was the passage that the that shah jahan took to visit the crypt and i would also think that to build such a massive structure that would weigh hundreds maybe thousands of tons it had to be placed on a large number of uh, chambers and those chambers would probably be the rooms that they are talking about you must have been inside all these rooms so did you find uh, anything that they are talking about no <laughs> um i think one thing one needs to make absolutely clear is shah jahan bought the land from raja man singh and those records are in have been translated are in begley and desai's book they are also in the jaipur city palace museum records so there's no doubt on that it was a mansion and remember also that the uh families were all intermarried so it was as much a family undertaking to buy the land from raja man singh uh as it was a business deal but you know uh shah jahan was very clear he gave man singh two havelis in the center of town in lieu of this we have i've been inside the corridors are painted the chambers were at that time really not in good shape but the asi just 10 days ago released photographs they've done a lot of restoration um let us also remember that beneath these chambers there are pilings there are the well foundations that are as much as 17 meters deep into the earth on the waterfront side which is the side really under the mausoleum these are very densely placed um 
wells because they needed to stabilize the monument at the water's edge. They thin out as you move further inland. So the wells are deep, they're 17 meters deep. There can be no evidence there. And we've seen the wells on the other side that they, they did an ASI did an excavation at Metamba. They go down mile, I mean, meters into the earth. Um, so yeah, I, I think these were very much uh, Shah Jahan's private chambers before he visited the um, crypt. And that, you know, I will say again, is something only Shah Jahan and perhaps his daughters did because even the ulema were upstairs. They were not allowed into the crypt. And the, all these records, this is all very well recorded. You know, Joaj kehte so kehte, but these are records that are available to anyone. No, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you clarified that. And, and you, uh, since you've been there, that, you know, the very idea, and, and as you were talking about the relation between the families, you know, I've been wondering, does it have something to do with the way we are taught history? See, what we are told about the Mughal period is that there is Babur, and then there is his son, Humayu, and then his son, Akbar, and then Jahangir, and so on and so forth. We get a reference that uh, Akbar had married the daughter of Bharmal, who is wrongly being called Jodabai by everybody and their uncles, but her actual name is Harkabai. But what we are not told, and, and this very rarely do, you know, uh, does one find out that Harkabai's niece was married to Jahangir, Jagat Gosain, and she is the mother of Shah Jahan. And Man Singh is the maternal uncle of Jahangir. Yes. And uh, Raja Jai Singh, Mirza Jai Singh, is his grandson, which would make him Shah Jahan's second cousin. So, now let us let us place these two cousins together. And it is Shah Jahan who tells his cousin, Bhai, my wife ki death ho gayi. मेरी बेगम की और मुझे उसका मजार बनाना और मुझे जमीन पसंद है और मैंने सुना है कि जमीन तुम्हारी है what would राजा जयसिंह tell him who is one of his senior most nobles he is called मिर्ज़ा he is a command of seven thousand which was reserved only for मुगल princes and he tells him no this is your land because your grandfather gave it to my grandfather and as you rightly mentioned that the land grants were not inheritance. They were given to a person upon his death, they would mm -hmm. revert back to the king. And since they were family, the remain, land remained there. And still, Shah Jahan takes this land and gives him three other estates in exchange. Because I was reading somewhere and he says that, you know, as per Islamic law, you cannot build a mausoleum or a mosque on somebody else's land. It has to be your land. And therefore, this transfer took place. And that's why it had to be documented. Yeah. You know, so and uh, we come to New Delhi. Sorry, I'm taking uh, so long. Uh, but, you know, it's a very interesting thing. When the British decide to uh, shift the capital in Delhi, the rulers of Jodhpur and Jaipur offer to surrender their land in Delhi for building the new capital. How did they get this land? They were given to them by a Mughal king as a gift. So, cannot place to uh, Hanuman Mandir was Jaisingpura. And uh, the Raisina Hill was with the Maranas of uh, Jodhpur. And the construction got delayed because these two families took more than 20 years to get no objection certificates from all their family members before the land could be handed over to the British. So, you know, there are enough records of these land grants which were given and were taken back or so at times were not taken back and therefore had to be bought. Yeah, I just thought I, you know, 
Uh, it's interesting that the Taj has that very clearly stated. Yes, absolutely. Not really. It's not really available for any other any other uh, monument that I know of. Perhaps you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was a mausoleum, and and they they wanted to be very much in the clear. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this is fascinating, and uh, uh, though you know, uh, every I think time what, I what, go, um, as you say, every time you go, there is this moment of <gasps> what perfection. Absolutely. But one of the things I do want to say is. What inspired us actually to get going with this book is Rahul and I were standing at the entrance to the, what is the Fatehbad gate, which is the gate where Indians in democratic India stand in a queue to enter the Taj. Um, they stand there for four to five hours to enter the Taj. And over time, I mean, we've been there so long, over time we just followed them and we followed their progress to the Taj. And what was profoundly moving was that they could be of any faith. They may have come from Ajmer, they may have come from Matra, was the reverence to our forefathers. That it has, it is trans faith. It didn't matter whether you were Hindu, Muslim, Christian, or Jew. They came to the Taj to pay reverence to their forefathers. They were willing to bake in the, they are willing to bake in the sun for five hours for a glimpse and they will throw money down. And now, of course, they've, there's so much money is thrown down, the ASI has now closed it uh, because they couldn't keep it clean. But it, it, we need to acknowledge that as a people, that is our culture, that is our heritage, and that is how we revere our forefathers. And it is a profoundly move. And we, you know, it's the Taj, but if you even go to Etmad Daula, where we worked also for five or six years, there are small ancillary graves where somebody is placing flowers, somebody has a reverence. This is, go to Bibi Ka Makbara. I have never seen so much money in my life as is thrown down on the grave because you see the grave from the upper gallery as at Bibi Ka Makbara. So, we also need to acknowledge our cultural heritage is a project product of these mixing and blendings and intermeshing uh, of cultures. These are, it's not just syncretic architecture, it's a syncretic culture that all of us are part of. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and just to, uh, you were talking of the syncretic, I saw this on the shrines of the Sufis in Uzbekistan. And they are virtually buried in money. All the in many places, the visitors are not allowed to approach the grave. They can see it from only from a second tier, three tier, and from there they are dropping money. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you know, and 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 that is how people express their uh, veneration. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. That, 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 was, that was very, very interesting. Yeah, I think uh, we'll, we'll open the floor for audience questions, Suhail sir. Yeah. So, uh, people who are on Zoom can send their questions through chat. Please send it to either everyone or Ishan Sharma so that I can get your messages and I can read out the questions. And those who are on YouTube can send their questions on YouTube Live. But thank you so much, Amita Ji and Sohil Saab for this wonderful conversation and very timely because I think it is important for my generation at least to know and understand history and heritage because these are polarized times. We are living in much polarized times where historians are being easily discredited based on some political statements. But uh, I think there is a question by Muhammad Anis that I'll read out. Were fountains there during the times of Shah Jahan? Are there fountains in Taj Mahal? Please tell us more about this. There are fountains in the water channels of the Taj Mahal. The, the central water channel has fountains and they are original. There are as many as 25 fountains in the octagonal pond of uh, Mehtab Bagh. And these are, um, yes, they were there from that time. 
there's so so clearly i mean the evidence of both is very clear in both these uh, sites and it's usually on the central channel in in a way i think it's actually if i may uh, yes uh, well, the, there was just one little detail that i wanted to bring up uh, the garden that babar built had fountains yes so this is much before shah jahan and we need to understand because this is with reference to the fountain or shivling debate that is going on about gyanwapi when people are saying there were no fountains at that now these people who have no idea because what the what came with the persians was also the persian wheel which could lift water from great depths and babar built two wells on the bank of the river and he and and those wells are still there and there were persian wheels that lifted water and in his garden he had reversed the slope of the land so that water when it was poured out of these uh, persian wheels it would flow down the channels and underground channels and feed the fountains since the water was falling from a height of about 30 40 feet and as water always seeks its own level when it was directed into narrow channels it would flow with great speed and then when you directed it to a spout you had a fountain you have the same procedure on the in uh, kashmir in kashmir, in kashmir also yes. you had the same arrangement in the taj in humayun's mausoleum yeah and the boundary wall of all these monuments had water channels so the water was taken from uh, as an aqueduct it was as an put, put through the channels and then guided into pipes that were buried inside the masonry that is how the fountains work i also think what was important why they one of the reasons why they did that is it kept the water flowing yes with the fountains yes. there was continuous aeration you never had stagnant water there was yeah, no yeah. algae collecting at the yeah, base yeah, 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 and the yeah. chadars also served that purpose so yeah. it was always flowing water in the gardens yeah. it's really evocative in kashmir in the in the mogul gardens because of course it comes down a slope and there. and the engineering it of and the engineering it uh, of of it because in delhi in the red fort they this canal that was brought to delhi from 300 130 kilometers away which supplied water to the red fort <coughs> the water was lifted 40 feet through a series of uh, yeah. uh water locks yeah you know so without motor pumps and all that you can still make fountains work and these people did that so it's a very long answer but yes there were fountains as uh, amita beg has already told you there were certainly fountains and they all of them worked thank you so much for answering that question and if uh, we can also take some audio questions if anybody wish to ask question directly can raise hand but we'll have to see if your name is credible and and something like that like phone names won't do so you have to keep your real name for the question there's a question by asha gopinathan a question is is there a good guide book to all the monuments and gardens of agra so we can explore all of them at leisure how safe are these places for women traveling alone <laughs> um as safe as anywhere else in india really um yeah i wouldn't no. like to comment on that um i'm fairly immersed in the landscape of agra i've never felt personally or or and we have very large teams and we've after the taj i worked 5 years with a large team in itmadodawla we were as safe as we are anywhere uh any any good books on monuments and uh, gardens of agra as she asked so many <laughs> so many there's somebody who wants to know about the crafts people yes i'll i'll read that question uh it's by rashmi kumari 
the question is quite large i'd like to read yeah i wanted to know more about the craft people as some of them are following the profession of their forefathers even now as well from where exactly the majority of crafts people are popping up to sustain the work which area exactly any reference to primary sources where they can know more about these people in detail can i take that question well you know there was a time when i uh, was uh, trying to raise money to make a film on the people who work on the inlay craft so i spent quite a lot of time with these people and uh, unfortunately that film didn't come about because the gentleman who was who had promised to give us the money to make the film uh, ran away when i when we told him how long it will take to make the film and how much making a film like this costs so but the film never got made but i met uh, some of these uh, traditional uh, stone lay people the stone do, do, who do this Petra Dura work, and the gentleman I met, he used to live in Tajganj, and he was a president's gold medal winner. And so these are crafts people who have been honoured by the state, and if I remember correctly, there are at least three of them, if not four, who have been, uh, who have received the president's gold medal for being the finest crafts people. and if you want to see what kind of work they do you just have to enter a up emporium anywhere and if you are in agra the emporia are all over and all of them are selling the produce of these workers at phenomenal uh, margins this gentleman i was talking to he had shown me a salwar that he had made it had taken him one year to make it and i asked him if i can raise the money and uh, if i want to buy it how much will this cost so he said uh, for you it is 1 lakh rupees and it has taken me one year because the rest of the time i have to uh, survive but this is what i love doing it has taken me a year to complete and it will cost you 1 lakh rupees and he said i had made a similar salwar like that and you will find it at so and so emporium so i went to see it at that emporium and there it was selling for 6 lakh rupees so that is the condition of these uh, phenomenally creative artists and uh, many of them lose their sight working on such minute at such minute level but we have very little protection for them and very as as uh, amita ji very rightly said that uh, unless we preserve them as our living heritage and uh, there is the state that finances these crafts persons all over the country there is very little hope of them surviving and they come from all over but but mostly they are the skills of from a father are transmitted to the son and from there to the son they still don't train their daughters because they will take the skills to another family yeah thank you so much sohil sir for answering that we have two raised hands so one is uh, one of my teammates at karwan najia rizvi she is a student at amu so najia would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question and if you want to turn on your video that's all right i have sent you the request to unmute Hello good evening everyone am i audible yes yes thank you ma'am thank you sir it was a wonderful session it almost felt like you had you've taken us throughout the you've actually taken us on a heritage walk throughout the city so uh, well my question is can you please tell us more about the char bagh plan because here we see at the taj uh, the focus is being shifted towards the river front the monument is now coming to the river front and now this shift be, um, becomes from the char bagh to chehriya setting and this shift was earlier first noted uh, at at matud dolas tomb where we see that a pavilion was erected at the river front while the monument was retained at the center the the mausoleum was retained at the center 
So can you please talk more about the uh, this entire plan of the garden, the setting? So Hale, would you like to do that? No, 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 no. I have no idea about this. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Nadia, I think what happens at Itmadodala is it was a pleasure garden. It was at Mododala's uh, Jagir and it was his pleasure garden. So the Baradari was on the waterfront, which is probably where they were, with the hammam underneath it, which is where what they would have used in the summer months. And it was certainly used, there are Kwaspuras below. So it was very, also the entrance to Etmadodala. And it is believed that the at the center of the Charbagh, where the tomb now is, there was another Baradari. So that gave way to the actual tomb and the water channel goes around it. Um, at the Taj, um, as you know, we have a very firm conviction that Shah Jahan envisioned the Jamna as the center of the Axis Mundi. It was the center of the grand plan with the sacred garden and tomb on one side and the moonlit garden, pleasure garden on the other. So it's not that it's uncentered, but that you change the axis the Axis Mundai is the river and that has fresh flowing water the year round. So it's no longer um, in the channels and being run through, it's actually the river. And you know, Shah Jahan was emperor of India. He owned, he owned India, he owned the river. So I think to that, the tomb being on the river actually is part of that. And so for those who could not visit the tomb because this was a sacred site, you would always see it reflected in the river, you would see it reflected in the octagonal pond. Um, so it actually changes the whole notion of how you perceive it. So when you see it in its entirety, um, from Mehtab Bagh to um, Taj Ganj, it's a single design plan and scale. Um, so you, and Chinika Rosa, for instance, is also not, um, was at the center of the Charbagh. So it really depended on how my, how they use the land earlier. Perhaps. And I think we're very clear that Taj Mahal is sort of the epogee of all this. It really rises to a completely other height where there's a garden. You've appropriated the river as well as part of your grand design. Oh, so what you are saying, and that this places the entire thing in a totally different perspective, that you have a north to south channel of water, which is the channel you encounter as you enter from the Julukhana. And there is a east to west channel, which is the Jamna. West to east. West to east or east to west, yes, is the way it flows, which is the Jamna. So you have these two streams crossing each other and where they cross is, uh, you know, they cross between the Taj and the Metabha, you know. So the the north to uh, south stream is actually not there, but you have water on that side and you have channel on that side. So so that is the actual center. The river is the actual center, yeah. which is which is really really remarkable. Because when you look at this, then you know you see how this Metabha is an Part is an integral part, part of, of the entire design. Yes. And you know, um, Sahel, if you, the measurement of the octagonal pond is the exact measurement of the base of the Taj Mahal, of mm -hmm. the mausoleum. So it's obviously it is, it is, it is part of this design. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. And, and it is the way we have been trained to look at the Taj, which has created this cleavage between the Mehtab Bagh and the Taj. They were they were part of a whole. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mita Ji and Soelta, for that answer. And I hope that answered Najia's question. We have two more hand ra raised hands, so I'll go to them and then I'll read two last questions for the for the conversation. Uh, Tara Dharasnan is part of our Karwan community. So Tara, would you like to ask a question? I have uh, sent you the Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my question actually is a little bit connected with Nadia's, but it's uh, it's wider than what she was asking. If you want to, you know, to kind of uh, 
engage with that is I've heard so much about the Charbagh, especially in connection with the Kashmir uh, Mughal Gardens. I am from Kashmir, but I've never fully understood that concept clearly explained either by anyone <laughs> or in a book. So is it possible just in a few minutes to explain the basics apart from, you know, the four, the division into four parts and then the fruit trees and then the flowering plants and things like that? So here? Well, no, no, I'll, 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 uh, I may be totally off the track, but I'll give you my take on this. And I believe uh, that this fourfold division, this has got something essentially connected to the four cardinal directions. And whatever religious religion you come from, there are multiples of four that are operating. And so you have Chalis Din Kachilla and eight. Yeah. And 32, you know, and I think they originate they orig originate from when people started becoming more aware of their surroundings, they first identified the east to west directions. And it was much later when they started moving out that they identified north. And in the northern hemisphere, the North Pole. And from there, the opposite of that, the south, and from that, and these four directions eventually informed quite a lot of religious practices. So I think this is where it comes from. And then you can keep on investing it into all kinds of denominational uh, imagination and then go into Hash Bahish, which is a multiplication of four by two. And, you know, but I think essentially it has to do with the cardinal directions, because if you look at all these gardens, they follow the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, you know, and where the two water streams, they are north, south, east, west, always, you know. So I think that is where it began. And uh, then you can interpret it the way you want. But I think that is where it started. Sorry. Uh, I don't know whether it is yes. true, but that is my gut feeling. I come from geography. My background is geography. So, you know, I have, uh, yes. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah, for your question. Um, Amrita, you have any comments on the question or should we move on? Uh, I think we can move on. Sure. Thank you so much, Tara. So we'll move on to uh, Sarthak Malhotra. Sarthak, if you can unmute yourself, I've sent you the request. Great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Th uh, thank you for this. Um, hello, Miss Big. Wonderful to hear you talk as always. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Hashmi. So I have a, we, we seem to have a garden theme. Um, so not to belabor the point, uh, what we see at the Taj Mahal is a British interpretation of a Mughal interpretation, ever Indian interpretation of whatever this place is. And clearly uh, what uh, we see today in its conservation, in its life, it doesn't seem to be working, right? It, it has a very bleak and dead future. The monument as it was a sacred site, has, its sacredness is sort of transformed in distinct ways. Um, its everyday connections with the neighborhood Tajgand have evolved, have been disrupted completely because of a massive tourist presence, but that is essential to Agra people's economies and their livelihoods as we've seen during COVID. So what is, according to the both of you, what does an ideal future look like, right? And we know we sort of are living with a state that we know is not going to put money into conservation, is not going to be promoting um, well, we're going, we're going to put more hurdles than help, let's put it that way. So what do you think, reflecting on your experience, um, because in my fieldwork experience at, in Taj Ganj, Taj Mahal, it's not great, but I was looking for some hope and I wonder if you'd have any. You know, uh, hi Sartak. Um, I think we need to understand that by the time Curzon arrived in 19, early 20th century in Agra, the garden was very overgrown. In the 19th century, it was part of Gwalia State and they were hosting dinner parties on the 
on the platform and there were festivities of banquets and dancing and so on. So it, it had already changed. It had, once the Mughal Empire um, declined, the patronage left. Um, and so with that, Although Agra, um, Shah Jahan is supposed to have made a huge provision, he, he had 54 revenue villages, the fruit um, from the garden was supposed to be sold. It just was overgrown and the gardens were the worst, worst off. So Curzon cleared it into the garden picturesque, the English garden, which was the only thing he knew how. He didn't respect the, um, they didn't understand or didn't know the metaphors and allegories relating to how these gardens were designed and planned. Um, I don't see, I would love to see the water systems restored in Agra, in the Taj, but please understand the Jamna River is now filthy, turbid, even the groundwater is contaminated. So at Itmadadala, where we have restored the garden, uh, we know one, it is an extremely expensive exercise to plant and to maintain. And secondly, there is no possibility of having the fresh flowing waters of the Jamna flowing through these water channels again. If you introduced water from the river without treating it, you would probably destroy the fabric of the water channels. So it's you're also dealing not with um, a government that doesn't want to do anything, you're dealing with an ecological reality where the groundwater is toxic, so toxic. We uh, installed a water treatment plant at Itmadadala, but you know, how much groundwater are you going to take in a city which doesn't have potable drinking water? So these are the realities of working in cities like this. Thank you so much, Satek, for that question. Bakir Mira wants to ask a question. I'll unmute them. Bakir, can you unmute? Uh, hello, are you getting me? Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Amita, ma'am. Uh, my name is Bakir. I'm a student of history. Uh, ma'am, I just wanted to know uh, uh, an answer regarding a question about the narratives, the false narratives being uh, like prevailing now in the days on social media. Uh, before a few days, I read in a book that the before construction of the Taj Mahal, there was a mosque. But most of the people claiming that there was a temple before the establishment or the construction of Taj Mahal. How could you justify that? Uh, is there any mosque? are a temple before the construction of Taj Mahal. And ma'am, uh, I just wanted to know that if we want to know the history of Taj Mahal objectively, uh, please can you suggest some books regarding the Taj Mahal? Thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you. Gosh, yes. Well, we've uh, discussed earlier that we know that Shah Jahan bought the land from Raja Man Singh. And if at all there was a structure, it was a mansion and a bagicha. So no, there was no mosque and no, there's no temple. Um, and the records of that land transaction are readily available. Um, I don't know, you know, what is on social media is on social media. The second question you asked was? I think about the book to, to know about- Oh gosh, about there are so many books, <laughs> so many books. <laughs> I think you need to. I think you need to read quite a few of them and arrive at your own um, conclusions as to how to read the Taj Mahal. Is I think the definitive architecture book is of course Eva Cox, um, but you, you know there are subsequently many many readings, uh, and today are much more. Um, I'd like to say that we now read our own cultural heritage slightly differently. <clears throat> And then there is Amita Beg and Rahul Mehrotra's book, Taj Mahal, multiple uh, narratives that you can get on. I think it's on Amazon, along with Eva Cox, The Complete Taj Mahal. So do read these two books. And then if you want to read a children's literature, there's the Lothama Shom's The Story Very of Taj Mahal. Uh, and, uh, if, I, if I may add, uh, 
you see a uh, the the question that backers have asked <coughs> i don't know where he has read that there was a mosque here you see and if he has read it this is the other end of the lunatic fringe <laughs> there is one group that claim that there is a temple here and there is another group that has to come with a counter and say there is a mosque here please if you are interested in finding out you will need to do some more hard work you will have to go and read the persian uh, farmans the land decrees all of them are there and uh, <coughs> amita ji has told you where they are available you need to go to the jaipur palace and or to the records of the archaeological survey of india and the documents are there there was no mosque there there was no temple there all those people who are raising it have some other agendas their agenda is not the preservation of our heritage you know so so please don't be you know don't get uh, uh, don't be swung into this kind of a thing somebody says there was a temple so you pull out something and say there was a mosque no use your common sense why would a mogal king demolish a mosque to build a mausoleum and 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 bakir saab should know that you cannot build a mausoleum or a mosque on land that does not belong to you so you will buy land and build on it and and all this is documented thank you so much sohil sir for that very important uh, intervention uh, we'll take two last questions for the for the evening because it's already time uh, i think i'll just and that also answers joel samuel's first question so we won't go for that but there is a question by sumit david say saying babar nama contains references of many many buildings and gardens built by babar in agra is rambagh the only one piece that survives from babar's reign um yeah yeah there's also chaburji which is where he was initially buried before his body was moved to kabul and there's a mosque so there are two or three babar time period buildings thank you ma'am uh joel samuel will this is the last question for the evening but before that thank you so much everybody for joining in uh, in such a large number we had over 55 56 people on zoom and many others on youtube so thank you so much everybody karwan is currently seeking support because we really need to sustain ourselves in in, in times that really needs initiatives talking about history to help us financially you can always join the karwan youtube membership it is 89 rupees per month which is cheaper than a cup of now in in times of such inflation so please please support karwan we really do need it the last question for the evening is uh, joel samuel's question isn't it true that architects artisans craftsmen of that era got influenced by existing types of architecture whether hindu or mughal architecture and that could have influenced certain motifs which are mistaken to prove existence of any other structure so hil sir would you like to absolutely absolutely you see um, my entire argument is that there is nothing called islamic architecture and there is nothing called hindu architecture and there are motives that people get attached to and uh, many of these motives have deep connections to their own livelihood for example the kalash the veneration of the kalash would go back to the time when you first made a clay pot and learned that if you fire it you can contain water in it and this liberated you from the tyranny of the stream you could carry water to your own house and middle of the night if you felt thirsty you didn't have to go crawling in search of a stream and from then the kalash becomes a symbol of sustenance and then 
you, the kalash happens when you have settled down to agricultural activity because only you know wandering uh, hunters and gatherers don't make pottery then you make kalash you are also doing uh, you are also carrying uh, you know growing crops and then you have to store the grain so you make those huge storage bins that you find in uh, uh, all the harappan sites and you make small vessels in which you store seed and that's because it is seed and life in it it becomes a symbol of fertility and it begins to be used in fertility rituals and since initially all our temples are devoted to gods of fertility the kalash begins to be carved there and from there it has traveled and now you find it on top of the taj it is the mason who carries it to the uh, to the uh, places of worship and from there to all places of veneration to temples and then when the central asians arrive when they build mosques the masons who are local people they carry their symbols of veneration in all good faith and they carve it in these buildings and that's how the lotus reaches there and that is how the six cornered star reaches there and that is how the swastik reaches there now if you find a swastik in uh, fatehpur sikri i shouldn't be letting it out there are hundreds of them there and then you start claiming that this is uh, an ancient uh, temple you will be barking up the wrong tree because this is what the masons and and there is one tablet where Uh, there is a mason who has carved a prayer to the god of uh, what is this god who you worship the god of crafts people vishwakarma yes Vishwakarma. so so there is uh, in somewhere in fatehpur sikri there is a uh, text dedicated to vishwakarma uh, saying we are building this please protect this this structure this is the mason is carving it because he loves his craft and he is invoking vishwakarma so that this building remains forever now this is how when people meet and they interact they mix things go to the uh, qutub minar the jama masjid in qutub minar look at the uh, verses of the quran intertwined with lotuses thousands of lotuses you know that is how when we talk of a syncretic culture this is what it is it is carved in stone for you you know and erasing this is not going to be easy you you can raise as much noise you create as much noise as you want but this is the lived experience of the people thank you so much sir amita ji any comment now i think um sohail's last comments were just a wonderful way to conclude the discussions i think that was very very rich um comment thank you thank you so much to both our speakers and uh, there is a lecture by sohail sahab on carwan about this thing that you all can you all must listen to and there are two ted talks by sohail sahab on the same theme that you can listen to on youtube you all must get amita beg and rahul mehrotra's book called taj mahal multiple narratives and ever cox the the complete taj mahal along with many other taj mahal books that are there uh, that i mentioned tilotam ashoms and thank you so much everybody for for being here this evening we will be back again with another carwan digital baithak uh, if we sustain if we manage to sustain ourselves so please help us sustain for another year hopefully we don't know but thank you so much everybody thank you so much sohil sir thank you so much amita ji thank you thank you for giving thank me you. the opportunity thank you amita it was great listening to you and you and you thank you, thank you.